Hi everybody, I'm Federico Pintore and I'm going to present a joint work with Ali Alkefarani and Shuichi Katsumata, where we propose low CC fish, an efficient signature scheme with tight reduction to the seasonal seaside 512. The title of the talk illustrates our contribution. We introduce a new signature scheme, low CC fish, that is tightly secure under the hardness assumption of a decisional problem over seaside 512. The scheme is secure both in the classical and quantum random oracle model, but the most relevant feature is that low CC fish achieves those properties while being almost as efficient as C fish. The signature size is exactly the same, public keys are twice as large as those of C fish, and also signing and verifying are at most twice as low. In the rest of the talk, I will try to give an overview of how low CC fish achieves the above listed properties. Spoiler, introducing a new low C identification protocol. Let me start by giving a quick overview on the relationship between isogeny based cryptography and digital signatures. This relationship has been slow moving until recently, since isogeny based problems turn out to be quite elusive to use for constructing digital signatures. The 2011 paper by Zhao and DeFeo, which introduced the SIDH protocol and coincides with the birth of isogeny based cryptography, contains an identification protocol but no mention of digital signatures. The first isogeny based signatures were proposed six years later in 2017. However, even the most optimized variant produces signatures of sites at least 12 kilobytes. Then in 2018, CSIGN was proposed, and a few months later, DeFeo and Galbraith published CSIGN based on the CSIGN paradigm. Despite providing signatures of remarkably small sites, signature generation and verification are quite slow. Finally, last year, an improvement of CSIGN named CFISH was proposed. CFISH enjoys practical efficiency in both signing and verifying, while maintaining the short signature sites offered by CSIGN. In the light of the above, we can confidently affirm that CFISH is the first practical isogeny based signature, but uh, this recent uh, idyllic life between isogenies and signatures is fragile. Indeed, CFISH is specific to one set of seaside parameters, namely seaside 512. Therefore, CFISH can offer at most the same security provided by a hard mathematical problem, GAIP, over the seaside 512 parameters. GAIP is believed to have 128 bits of classical security and at most 64 bits of quantum security. However, CFISH is based on the Fiat Shamir paradigm and like every Fiat Shamir signature, CFISH has a very loose reduction both in the random oracle model and in the quantum one. To be more precise, if lambda represents the bits of security of the hard mathematical problem, then the digital signature cannot offer more bits of security than lambda minus log 2 of the number of queries to the random oracle, everything divided by 2. Therefore, a hard problem offering 128 bits of classical security, assuming a modest 2 to 40 queries, cannot offer more than 44 bits of security to the digital signature. In the quantum random oracle model, the situation is even worse. Usually, the reduction loss is absorbed by the hard problem, incrementing the parameters. But in this case, the situation is different, since CFISH relies on a hard problem over a specific set of parameters, CSIDE 512. To resolve this issue, a tight reduction would be needed. The plan for what comes next is the following. I'll start by recalling what a loss identification protocol is, then I'll describe our loss identification protocol and I'll explain why a tight reduction can be derived from a loss identification protocol. Finally, I'll conclude by discussing concrete security and efficiency of low CC fish. A loss identification protocol is primarily an identification protocol. Let R be a polynomially computable binary relation on the Cartesian product of two finite sets, X and Y. 
Then an identification protocol ID for R is an interactive protocol between a prover and a verifier composed by four probabilistic polynomial time algorithms, iGen to generate statement witness pairs, P1 and P2 run by the prover, and V run by the verifier. Informally, the goal is that of making the prover prove to the verifier that given a statement X in X, they possess a valid witness W without revealing anything more than the fact they know W. Here we specify that W is a valid witness if the pair XW belongs to R. The protocol is free move, so we have a prover and a verifier. The prover produces a commitment running P1, the verifier uniformly samples a challenge, the prover runs P2 obtaining a response, the verifier then runs the algorithm V, which is deterministic, and the output is either accept 1 or reject 0. The properties usually required to an identification protocol are correctness, honest verifier zero knowledge, high mean entropy, perfect unique response, which is not a standard property, but it's useful in our contest, and <clears throat> our protocol enjoys that property which states that with overwhelming probability over the statement witness pair output by iGen for any commitment and challenge, there exists a unique response such that the commitment, the challenge and the response form a valid transcript for the statement output by iGen. Finally, we have two special soundness, which informally states that a cheating prover can cheat in at most one challenge. Now, the question is, the question is, what makes an identification protocol a lossy protocol? Firstly, the protocol has another algorithm called lossy iGen, which produces lossy statements. So they are in the set X, but not necessarily in the language of R. These lossy statements must be indistinguishable from statements in the language. Then, in terms of properties, instead of two special soundness, we require the statistical lossy soundness, which is formalized by means of an interactive game between an adversary A and the challenger. The adversary is given a lossy statement, chooses a commitment, receives a uniform challenge from the challenger, and has to output a response that, together with the commitment and the challenge, must form a valid transcript for the lossy statement. We want the probability of A winning the game, Epsilon LS, to be negligible. As we already said, the lossy iGen must produce lossy statements, and the advantage of an adversary in distinguishing a valid statement and a lossy one must be negligible. This completes the definition of lossy identification protocol. Now let's jump to our seaside based lossy identification protocol. Let's start by fixing the notation using the bare minimum amount of maths. We start from a finite abelian group G and a finite set X. We assume that the group G acts freely and transitively on X, hence there is a map star which satisfies the first few properties on the right. For the freedom and transitivity of the action, we want that if we fix an element in G, the map from X to X it induces is a bijection. On top of that, for cryptographic purposes, we want the action to be able to be efficiently computed, but on the other hand, given G star X, it must be hard to recover G. This problem is called GIP, Group Action Inverse Problem. Let me just note that in Seaside, the group G is the ideal class group of an order O, while X is the set of supersingular elliptic curves over a prime field F, for which the endomorphisms over FB form a ring isomorphic to the order O. Anyway, we can safely skip these details and just bear in mind that elements of X are elliptic curves. Now we restrict to the case where the structure of G is known and it is cyclic of order N, with G as a generator. This is the case for the group G obtained from the seaside 512 parameters, hence the case of Cfish. Now that we have fixed the notation, we can state the hard problem on which we rely. We named it decisional seaside, this seaside in short. 
The problem consists in distinguishing between the two following distributions. The first one has two uniformly random curves, E and H, and then G2A star E and G2A star H, where A is uniformly random in Zn, and so G2A is uniformly random in G. The second distribution is composed by four uniformly random curves. In order to present our loss identification scheme, I'll start with that of Cfish. There, the public parameters correspond to a prime p, a generator g of the group g, the order n of g, and a fixed ellipt curve is 0 in x. The binary relation Rcfish is composed by pairs E a, where E is an ellipt curve in x, and a is such that g to a star is 0 is equal to E. Hence, we have a prover and a verifier, and the prover has a pair E a, where A is the secret witness, while E is the public statement. Then the interaction between the prover and the verifier goes as follows. The prover uniformly samples R in Zn and computes the commitment G to R star is zero. The verifier uniformly samples a challenge bit. The prover responds with R if the challenge is zero, hence the blue path, with A minus R in the case the challenge is one, hence the green path. The algorithm V checks if the challenge is zero, that G to the response star is zero is equal to the commitment, otherwise that G to the response star the commitment is equal to E, which is the public statement. Now, the key point is that this identification scheme does not admit lossy keys, since each statement in X has a corresponding witness. This is due to the fact that the action star is free and transitive. So, in order to obtain a lossy scheme, we have to change something, and our modification is pretty clean. Instead of considering one starting curve E0 as part of the public parameters, we split it into two starting curves E01 and E02, which are now part of the statement. Then the same element A of Zn is used to compute two other curves E11 and E12. These four curves form the statement A is the witness. So in picture, we split E0 into two curves. The action of the random element G to B sends E0 in E01. The action of the random element G to C sends E0 in E02. Now it's as if the previous graph was mirrored. Consequently, the commitment is now composed by two parts, COM1 and COM2. The challenge and the response remain the same, but now also the workload for the verifier is doubled, since if the challenge is zero, it has to verify that com i is equal to g to the response star e zero i for i equal to one and two. If the challenge is one, it has to verify that e one i is equal to g to the response star com i for i equal to one and two as well. It's easy to prove that the described scheme satisfies correctness, honest verifier zero knowledge, high mean entropy, and perfect unique response. Furthermore, it has statistical lossy soundness. More precisely, the advantage epsilon ls of an adversary A in the loss impersonation game is equal to one half plus one over two times n. I will go back to statistical lossy soundness in the following slides. But before that, it's important to observe that the protocol has indistinguishability of lossy statements. Indeed, a real statement is composed by E01 and E02 that by construction are uniformly random, and then G2A star E01 and G2A star E02. On the other end, a lossy statement is just a tuple of four uniformly random ellipt curves, and this two these two tuples coincide with those of the two distributions in the DC side problem, which we assumed to be hard. So this completes the description of our loss identification scheme. We still have to address why it's so important to have a loss identification protocol to obtain a Fiat Shamir signature scheme with tight security. We recall that the Fiat Shamir transform turns an identification protocol into an uninteractive one, and in turn, into a digital signature. The trick is pretty simple. Instead of obtaining the challenge from the verifier, the prover computes it as the digest of a hash function h, 
on input the commitment and the message. The hash function is modeled as a random oracle in the security proof of the digital signature, which satisfies existential unforgeability thanks to the properties satisfied by the underlying identification protocol. Under some hypothesis, the security proof can also be given in the quantum random oracle model. The reason why lossy identification protocols are important for having a tight security proof is the following theorem by Kills, Lubashevsky, and Schaffner. Let ID be a lossy identification protocol satisfying all the properties we have introduced so far. Correctness, honest verifier zero knowledge, it has alpha bits of mean entropy, perfect unique response, and epsilon LS statistical lossy soundness. Then the advantage of an adversary A against the strong affordability game is bounded by the advantage of an adversary B against the distinguishing of lossy statements plus epsilon ls times 1 plus the number of queries to the random oracle made by A plus 2 to minus alpha plus 1 where alpha is the mean entropy plus the advantage of an adversary D against the pseudo-random function used to de-randomize de the Fiat Shamir signature. Note that the only difference between the case where H is modeled as a classical random oracle and the case where H is modeled as a quantum random oracle is in the factor containing QH. In the classical setting, this term is linear. In the quantum setting, it is quadratic and it is multiplied by a factor equal to 8. Now, what's the moral of this result? Well, if epsilon ls, 2 to minus alpha plus 1, and the advantage against the PRF are small enough, the security of the signature scheme tightly adheres to that of the hard problem on which the statistical indis indi indistinguishability relies. In our case, the decisional seaside problem. At this stage, a natural observation would be, well, the epsilon LS of your scheme is not really small, since it is equal to 1 half plus 1 over 2 times n. This is true, but it is typical to make the lossy soundness epsilon ls negligibly small by standard parallel repetitions of the identification protocol. Specifically, on input a pair statement witness, the prover runs parallel executions of the protocol. T parallel rounds make epsilon ls equal to 1 over 2 to t plus 1 over n. However, standard parallel repetitions may be problematic for the efficiency of the digital signature scheme. So we have another option to make epsilon ls small, which is decrease 2. Indeed, that 2 derives from the cardinality of the challenge space, which contains 0 and 1. We adapted the tricks introduced in CSIGN and CFISH to enlarge the challenge space of our lossy identification protocol. The result is a new binary relation and a new hard problem with a reduction from the seasonal C side. In our original relation, the statement contains a couple of starting curves E01 and E02, and then a couple of arriving elliptic curves E11 and E12, obtained with the same witness A. In the variant that enlarges the challenge space, a statement still contains a couple of starting curves E01 and E02, but then it is composed by S pairs of arriving elliptic curves E11 and E12 till ES1 and ES2. The witness is now composed by S elements in Zn, A1, A2 until As. Under this modification, the lossy soundness epsilon ls is given by the following expression, where the 2 times S plus 1 at the, at the denominator of the first term is the cardinality of the new challenge space, considering also the use of quadratic twist as suggested in the CFISH paper. This ends the focus on the importance of having a loss identification protocol. To conclude, we put everything together to discuss security and efficiency of the lossy CFISH digital signature scheme. We used the result by Kills, Lubashevsky and Schaffner to estimate the security of lossy CFISH, that is the digital signature obtained applying the Fiat Shamir transform to our loss identification protocol with enlarged challenge space. For the classical security, the following inequality holds. We are interested in the bits of security of our scheme. 
So we have gamma bits of security if there does not exist an adversary that breaks the scheme with success ratio bigger than 2 to minus gamma, where the success ratio is the quotient between the adversary's success probability and its running time. The, the enlargement of the challenge space changes the hardness assumption for the loss indistinguishability. In particular, the first term in the right side becomes S times the advantage in solving the DC side problem. So we obtain this. Since the best known algorithm for solving the decisional C side is the one solving GIPE, assuming a running time for the adversary B equal to 2 to 128, its advantage is 1. Since the statement of the theorem holds for the running times of adversaries A, B, D being equal, we divide each term by 2 to 128. For the second term on the right side, we grant the adversary A at most 2 to 128 queries to the random oracle. And as done for C fish, we consider a hash function which is a factor 2 to U slower than a standard hash function, as for example Shafri. By plugging in the value of epsilon ls and doing some approximations, that's what we obtain. Now the idea is to consider distinct possible values for s and u and for each of them determine the value of t giving the biggest security level. This table contains the results and also a comparison with CFISH in terms of public key sites. We note that S is always of the form 2 to minus W. Hence, by biggest security level, we mean 128 minus W minus 1. This means that the bigger the value of S, the smaller the security level obtained. But we note that for S equal to 1, for example, we only lose one bit of the security provided by the GIPE problem over C side 512 parameters. For the quantum security, the computations are pretty much the same. The best known quantum algorithm for the GIPE problem is Kuperberger's algorithm for the hidden shift problem, which has a sub-exponential complexity. However, the concrete security estimates are still an active area of, of research. So we considered 56 bits of quantum security as a conservative choice and 64 bits as a more optimistic choice. We bounded the number of queries to the random oracle accordingly and the results are contained in this table. Finally, for the computational costs, we observe that they are dominated by the computation of class group actions. For the key generation, we need 2 times s plus 2 of m, while for signing and verifying, we need 2 times s of m. The comparison with those required by CFISH shows that we can safely deduce that our scheme is at most twice as low as CFISH. For concrete estimates of the running time, we considered two tuples of values of s, t and u respectively. These two tuples offer a small signature sites and a small sum of signature and public key sites respectively. The numbers reported for, for these tuples suggest that with CFISH and low CFISH, isogeny based signatures have entered the realm of practicality, but they still need to gain efficiency. That's all from me. Thanks for your attention.